Okay, Thank welcome, um, welcome everybody. Uh, uh, apologies, we're a few minutes late if you're watching us live uh, coming on. Um, and if you're listening after the fact on YouTube or to the podcast, then, then that apology means nothing, of course. But we're here recording episode number 96 of Podchat Live. We're recording this on the 7th of October 2021. And we're excited about this one. We've got our guest here, Dr. Laura Meal, and our episode uh, topic is the, the psyche of the injured athlete and the psychology of, of injury which uh, if you know Craig and I know that this is a topic that fascinates us. So by way of brief introduction for Laura, and, and this won't do her CV uh, any justice at all, so apologies, Laura, but she has a, a PhD in psychology uh, with a sports and exercise medicine emphasis, uh, 30 years of experience in the sport, fitness and education industries. And um, I think it's fair to say is very much been an elite athlete herself playing Division One basketball at Arizona State, not to mention football and, and boxing as well. And uh, as I'm sure she'll come on to, to, to mention through this episode, has her own experience of what it's like to be an elite athlete who has uh, injury that perhaps ends, ends her career and the, and the psychology associated with that. So firstly, Laura, thank you so much for, for joining us uh, from Pennsylvania. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, Throughout this, we're going to plug your book, uh, and I know you haven't asked us to do it, but it's it's essentially uh, what got, got Craig and I, here it is here. Uh, it's what got Craig and I in touch with you to do this episode. When Craig sent me the link and said, "Have you seen this book?" and I said, "No," but as I always do when Craig sends me a link, I go onto Amazon, I buy the book, and I read it, and I read it, and he read his, and I said, "We need to we need to invite Laura on to, to talk about this." So we're going to be leaning on this uh, fairly heavily, and we'll put a link down into the comments because it's a really fascinating. Um, a really fascinating read um and ultimately when i was reading it i felt like the context for for the book was kind of with reference to elite athletes or athletes at the very pointy end of competition that were looking at the the phenomena of sort of their career ending but i feel there was so much in there that, that could apply to us as podiatrists and the athletes we see in our clinics who perhaps aren't elite but the non-elite who are looking at forced sort of breaks from training or you know hiatus from training any an injury of any kind um apologies. i can't hear you well, well she just went you just went we just lost you a little bit there in no yeah, sorry laura Ian, we, we can't hear you in no No, we totally lost you there, Ian. <laughs> okay. Okay. Ian's just going to head how, off. How about, and, how about now? You got oh, me? There you are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know how far into my ramblings you got. So, uh, yeah, forgive me. I, I don't know when you lost me or, or what You were about there. to get to the application of what I speak about to what you guys do. Perfect. How yeah. the athletes you, are injured. And, yeah. You got it. My ramblings were irrelevant anyway. So, yes, um, what the things we do well, the things we don't do well, and, and just talk about the psychology of the in injury and the injured. So, From my experience, not only as an athlete, but working with a lot of different surgeons and sports medicine doctors, um, the person who was injured doesn't necessarily have to be somebody who was um, elite or a professional athlete because we have a lot of people who what they what helps their psyche and what helps them um, is their training or their exercise or even playing you know, what I call a weekend warrior, you know, where you play softball or basketball on the weekends. And when you're told you can't play for a specific amount of time, it affects you, you know, and um, in the book, I, I go into what happens with where you can go fall into a depression, but I'm going to leave it at that to see what other questions you guys have. And then I can elaborate because I can go on and on, you know, so uh, <laughs> I'll just wait for your guidance. Yeah, sure. that you, you want me to speak about. Okay. You're back now, Ian. <laughs> can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I don't know what's going on. I apologize. I've That's got okay. Really Got rid of my earphones i think they're the culprit so uh, i should probably invest in some slightly higher tech uh, equipment 96 episodes in perhaps you, you could argue <laughs> um, but i've just got a list of things i was uh, the bullet points to to go through and obviously uh, as always if anyone's watching and they have any questions for laura as we go along fire them in the comments and craig will 
do the necessary and bring them into the discussion. But I, I, I would love to start, if it's OK, just talking, Laura, about what when an injury is first sustained by an athlete and in your experience as an athlete who's had injury, but also as someone who has you know, coached numerous athletes over the years, what, what sort of um, processes, psychological processes first occur? Because what 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 jumped out to me from your book was the 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 sort of uh, way it could almost be compared to grief or some people have compared it to, to the to the stages of grief so could you talk us through the psychological process of of sustaining an injury initially well i think the, the first thing is that an athlete's pissed you know they're mad <laughs> that they're injured you know uh, uh, and, and this is and i was just saying before when you were going back to the other computer i was saying that it doesn't have to necessarily be an elite athlete. It's just anybody who finds their finds their outlet in athletics, being an athlete, what they want to call an athlete, by running, jogging, working out, and then they're told they can't. So the first thing is, yeah, I'm pretty mad that I'm injured. But then when they realize that the injury they sustained could be long term or could stop, you know, um, them for a long period of time or forever. Um, they definitely go through the stages of grief where um, what I use in my book that I call that I've noticed with when I've worked with many gymnasts, um, many, I worked with many athletes, but I see it a lot per, with everyone, but predominantly with um, like gymnasts or figure skaters because they're the kind of athletes who are working four hours, five hours a day, every day, and then all of a sudden it stops and it's like they hit a wall and I call it like a situational depression. And then you start going through, well, am I going to be okay? And there's that psychological process of, will I come back? How will I come back? And when that happens, then there's a little bit more anger, you know, and then will, will I be all right? And they're, and they're not sure if they, and if they can be okay. And these are for athletes, we'll go for athletes who are completely done versus the ones who have to rehab. Sometimes their rehabilitation can be hindered because they have the fear of re-injury. And they feel like they're not going to be that athlete that they were before. Will they be the same? Can I jump as high? Can I run as long? Can I endure? And that's when that depression can really knock, right, you know, in the back of their head and, and get them into, into a slippery slope. And the question comes, how do they get out of that? How can they, re how can they recover from it, either when it's done and and when it's not and i'm not going to elaborate I'll, I'll ask for more see what other questions you have and then i'll keep going yeah and, and the one thing um you know when you look at the, the classic stages of grief one of the um stages that's often referred to is denial and i don't know about you but we see this in i see this in a lot of athletes where you're giving them uh information or news and they've been training for an event you know let's say they've put a lot of time and effort into training for a marathon and you're fairly close to that time where you have to make a decision about whether it's a smart thing to compete in or not. Um, and certainly when I was reading about sort of injury sort of masquerading as grief, and you hear about denial being a big phase of grief. I don't know about you, but I see, I see in a lot of the athletes where they're just like, I refuse to acknowledge this injury until after the marathon. Is that something you, you've got reasonable um, experience with as well? Oh, as an athlete myself, and, all, and also working with, you know, with a variety of athletes, what happens is as soon as you tell uh, the majority of the athletes, I would say somewhere who are very serious about what they do, um, as soon as you start saying about giving description of the injury and how long they might be out and that they cannot, you know, I recommend you do not compete in this next thing. I don't know if if you guys ever watch the Peanuts or Snoopy or when you hear the people on the phone, all they hear is wah, 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 wah. They don't want to hear what you have to say. No, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make it through. I'll deal with my injury later. Now, as we know, the only thing they're going to do is exasperate that injury. And sometimes people don't realize that exasperation can end their career period. Now, that's what I have dealt with. Now, in terms of myself as an athlete, um, I was – Boxing in the gold. I was training for the Golden Gloves. I was uh, going to the semifinals back in 2004, I believe. And my back went out again for the second time where it was seriously injured. I was being trained by um, a pro trainer and he just ripped me down. He was showing me some tactics and I wasn't ready for it. And my back just went out again and that was it. 
So um, my nerve was pinching. I couldn't walk. And I went to um, a doctor, a, a really big doctor, the Hospital of Special Surgeries in New York City. And he's like, um, yeah, you're not competing. I'm like, no, I am. <laughs> you know, yes, I am. You're not going to tell me I'm not. He's like, no, you're not. Well, it got to the point where I kept sparring and I only sparred with men. So I really got beat up. It wasn't like I was, you know, and women are tough too. Don't get me wrong. Cause I've been hit by some serious women, but guys didn't hold up, you know, hold up and they hit me. So I kept going and I exasperated my back a little bit, even though my back had already been injured from years ago. So it was never fully recovered because I was one of those athletes that you're saying that said, Hey, I'm going to keep going. Um, but what happened was I wind up having major spinal surgery. Um, even though the doctor told me not to fight in the semifinals, I, he said, if you lay in bed for three weeks and you don't go up and downstairs, I'll let you fight, but you have to get yourself in shape laying in bed. I said, fine. So I took weights and I did as many punches as I could laying in bed with my, you know, I was all wrapped after the surgery and I, and I did nothing but um, I trained in the gym. I mean, not in the gym, in the pool. I got myself in a pool. One of my friends trained me. I discussed it, I think, in my book. And I got in the pool and I got strong. But I wasn't that strong. My legs, you need legs when you box. And I went in there. And um, unfortunately, it took me a long time to recover from that. I was never right in box again after that because my back just got so bad. And I had to spend extra time had I not fought rehabbing. So it was, you know, it was detrimental to myself. But at that time I was about to be 32 and you couldn't fight amateur anymore. And since I made it that high, I wanted to keep going. And you see it a lot with other people, they do that and they don't realize the ramifications. And I, I learned, there goes my, you know, I wanted to be a pro boxer at that time too. And there, once again, cause of my back, but it was also my fault because I didn't listen to my surgeon. Yeah. And could I get your take on, um, obviously people have, different personalities um you know all sports people have very common traits i think it's fair to say particularly the more elite they become but generally if you're into sport you're probably you have certain sort of personality traits that are similar but you're still individuals so everyone has individual responses to news they receive or, or how they're going to approach their rehab uh, have you noticed any sort of uh any any anything that that could sort of predict whether people will do well. Yeah, well, let, let, let's go back a step. When people are given news of, of an injury, you know, they can either take that, they can take that news well or take it not so well. And then when they're laid out, this is what a, a management strategy should look like. They can either say, right, I'm going to totally commit to this. I'm going to, or they can ruminate and catastrophize and, and you know, um, go, go down a different path. Is there any traits you've noticed that can sort of predict who may go one way and who may go the other? Yes. Um, so when I, when I uh, was studying to have my doctorate, I actually um, tested people with ACL injury, their anxiety and their post-operative pain. And what happened was I, it's basically providing information, giving people the proper sensory and procedural information about their injury and what can occur during physical you know, therapy and what can happen thereafter, I believe can be extremely helpful. So if you see people who are, like we said, the denial, or they're really anxious, those are the people that you have to watch out for who probably will adhere as well to rehabilitation. Those who want to know what they need to do to make it better, who have the information, and if you can provide the information, tend to do a lot better with less oper you know, with less pain, even if it was an operation, less post-operative pain, because the anxiety is reduced about it. When when I studied the ACL injuries, it was basically um, if we gave people procedural and sensory information versus people we did not, um, even though I didn't have a, a I should I wish I would have had a larger population um, of patients at the time, but judging from all my experience thereafter of working with other types of patients and speaking to them about various injuries, I noticed that when you give them um, post uh, preoperative sensory information and procedural information, what's gonna happen, what to expect, you find their anxiety is actually less after a procedure and when and if they were to find out about the injury and the, the pain starts to minimize because remember you, we all know the mind body component is so important and if you can get someone to wrap 
their mind around the injury and what steps they're going to need in order to get better and you let them know ahead of time that whole want 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 and that denial you know where they're hearing they're actually going to stop and listen to you because you're also providing them with a solution as opposed to saying here's the problem you know you have an injury kind of like what john mishock dr mishock spoke about about labeling an injury instead of saying well okay you have to tell them what their injury is but here's the solution this is based on what you're telling me as a runner or as a basketball player and give them the layout, you know, so then they can see past the injury and see that they can get through it. Because if all they hear is the injury, you can't, you can't, you won't, then they're going to, they're going to end up getting themselves in trouble and get hurt. Yeah. And it's all about also the message in which the way you send it. Um, I used to go out and give sensitivity talks to a lot of doctors because I would sit, when I was doing my studies for um, my dissertation, I would see how long, uh, I would compare the minutes a doctor would spend with their um, patient, but within those minutes, where, what the content consists of and how two minutes for this, three minutes for that, and how they told, you know, so I've watched an orthopedic surgeon um, a little boy baseball player, you know, thinking he's going to be in the pros one day. And um, he, he had something happen with his shoulder. And it wasn't a completely a torn rotator cuff, but he was going to be out for a good six, eight weeks. Now you're telling this kid who's playing kind of travel recreational ball at his age um, that his season's pretty much done. And the doctor comes in and he's like, well, this is what's wrong with you. Looks at the mother, tries to explain it, doesn't explain it in layman's terms. It was very technical, um, difficult to follow, probably scary for the child. He broke down in tears because as soon as he goes through the technicalities of it and you're done for the season. But without skipping a beat, you know, not having any type of empathy, you know, for this child who his aspirations, I'm going to be in the major leagues. Now, if he gets there or not, who knows? But that one thing as a doctor, as a surgeon, you can make or break in one phrase, one sentence, one word, uh, the psyche of an athlete. I mean, you really can. And it's so imperative that um, there, there's a little bit of being sensitive, you know, um, there's a difference between, you know, the mentality of everybody gets a medal and they're yay for all the athletes and being sensitive to the fact that here's a child who's probably been working really hard with a pitching coach or a hitting coach and works outside of practices. So all that hard work and now he's injured, bam, he hits that wall and a doctor comes in and crushes him. You know, that can make it even harder for any type of recovery. Because again, depending on the personality type, that kid might say, I quit, I'm done. Or the kid's gonna be like, screw you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you and I'm gonna be okay. So it just depends, right, on, on the message. Yeah, it's fascinating a few things you've said there that really tie in, understandably so, with previous episodes we've done with, with pain scientists on, you know, the concept that pain is, is complex and it's not just a, barometer of the status of the tissues and there are psychosocial contributions and components to it so it kind of it kind of all makes complete sense that you know when we know that that psychological variables like stress anxiety depression or you know are all going to kind of contribute to the persistence of pain and when all this kind of nocebic language that you just refer to is going to feed into those psychological variables it it, it totally makes sense and links in with with previous things we've spoken about and i know that in your book um, you make reference to sort of physical and mental recovery. And I don't, I nearly said physical versus mental, but that's probably not, that's probably not versus that. Is it fair to say every injury, regardless of personality trait, regardless of level of competition and regardless of the type of injury, every injury has both physical and mental factors and considerations. Is that a reasonable comment? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a bit about the things, I mean, you've already touched on it there, but the things that we as, as doctors, clinicians, podiatrists, coaches, whoever's listening, the things that we do, don't do well, and the things that we do do well, or we all, you know, how, you know, things that we can do better. Um, and you already made reference there to the language we use. Um, Going back to Dr. Mishok, John Mishok's comment, I know in your book he said, don't never label an injury. I believe the exact quote was never label an injury as it stifles recovery. Um, yet 
I, I think we're all guilty of trying to label injuries because what we think we're doing when we do that is giving information. And as you've also said, giving information is probably useful as well. So how do we how do we tread the line between those two things that seem a little bit conflicted? So I, I think uh, what he means, because we spoke extensively about this, about what, because, you know, he's a physical therapist and a child will come in and say, well, they say I have the beginning of a Tommy John injury, you know, the elbow injury, which if anybody hears that, you know, all of a sudden, oh, well, I'm doomed. So how, you know, how is it that you get around it? You explain, I think it's really important to be able to, like I said, give information behind what the injury entails. And, and then be, but be honest, if there's an athlete that, I mean, has something that's complete, if they tore their PCL and ACL, we'll say, you know what I mean? And PCL is very difficult to, to, you know, come back from it. And then a combination of an ACL, um, you have to let them know you have a nine month to a year recovery. However, you still can come back. So I think that being able to let them know, look, this is the injury you this this injury is not going to define you do not let the injury define you um but you, and you know as well as i do there's certain injuries that you might have to tell people listen you know your 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 bones are are not going to maintain so well if you continue to run on the concrete okay if you continue to run on the street you know, you're, you're just not going to be able to do that. Well, how do you don't pigeonhole them to say they, they can't run? I mean, I'm sure there's times you tell people that they can't. Am I am I right? Like, so then you try to, well, maybe it's time to swim, <laughs> you know, but in, in a way where they can understand that exercise is not over, it just might be in a different capacity, you know, and you have to explain the injury. Even though putting a label and just saying, well, this is the injury and that's it. And that's what I think he means where it's so concrete, as opposed to holistically discussing what it entails and what you're going to have to do to get better. And then what you may have to do in lieu of what you're doing now. Yeah. And I've certainly, in my experience, I found that when they are given labels or information, when I've given them in the past, their response sort of depends on their understanding or their beliefs about that label. And, and, and so, you, for example, you say someone said, you know, you say, oh, this could be plantar fasciitis. Well, everyone knows someone who's had that. Perhaps a friend of theirs has been suffering with it for two years. They read it, you know, and all of a sudden just just the label is like, oh, no, I, this is what I was afraid of. Whereas other injuries, you know, that, that are known to be a bit less uh, sort of recalcitrant, they, they respond to you differently. They're like, oh, great. Okay, well, you know, in many ways, most people prefer a fracture than they do a tendinopathy because a fracture just, to them at least, rightly or wrongly, has such a, a sort of set healing time. Um, whereas, you know, tendinopathies can wax and wane and things like that. And I, I watched a lot of football um, at soccer in the 80s. And when people, when soccer players got ACLs in the 80s, you know, early 80s, it was kind of like career over, really. Um, yeah. and, and now you watch it now and you see a couple of season and all you kind of go is, oh, OK, well, he's got he's got a tough year of rehab ahead of him. But, but you know, it, I, I can only imagine the player's mindsets now must be so different knowing that this I already know this isn't a career ending injury. So the type of injury has got to factor into this, too. Right. Correct. I mean, the, the type of injury. Um, with the, the technology today and the different type of surgeries, I mean, I, my fiance just had back surgery not that long ago and six weeks, he didn't even go to physical therapy. He's doing great. I'm like, how's that? You know, I was like dying when I had it in the nineties, you know, because of the different techniques today. And, and I think that's the important thing. And that's where I think Dr. Mishak meant with the labeling, you know, like you just said, give them the information and say years ago, this would have been an issue because the, your older patients that you have are going to go back to what they know, their only knowledge of the 80s and 90s of injuries and seeing certain athletes be injured. So that's there's a stigma there. So it's important for them to understand that, hey, it, it's not like it was. We have different techniques, different you know technology for surgery or surgical repair or for rehabilitation that we do that we learn that are better. And I always you know say to people when they come to me and they're having problems you know psychologically with dealing with their injuries. I go, do you really know about your injury? Do you really understand it? 
And they're like, well, not really. I go, well, why don't you, you know, and I help them usually guide them, find some peer reviewed journals, read about the rehabilitation of these injuries, how to adhere to it better. And, and I think that's really something that's important for them to tell them, look, there's literature out there. I suggest you, you research it because, you know, while I write in my book, information is power. And especially for an injured athlete, the more that they know, um, of course, the more, you know, we don't want them diagnosing themselves like a lot of people do on WebMD, right? So you, you, when you tell them, you, you want to be very crystal clear, hey, this is what's going on, you know, um, plantar fasciitis, this is what you need. Some people might need a boot. Okay, you wear your boot at night, do the exercises, and yeah, it's going to hurt, but it's not going to kill you, you're good. But sometimes people hear it, oh, it's horrible, because the pain can be very bad. So in their mind, the pain is so bad, they can't do it. So how do they counteract that? And that's also things they have to learn, you know, visualization, meditation, how to relax the body. If the body is not relaxed, no matter the, the injury, it could be from zero being nothing to, you know, 20 being super serious. OK, if someone's at a five and it's an injury. It's like we were talking about, it's going to be here, too, in terms of pain. If you tense up or you get stressed out or there's other stressors going on in your life, it is going to exasperate the pain in your foot, you know, in your shoulder, in your elbow, in your knee, wherever, you know, it is going to exasperate it if you cannot handle the stressors because it's not just the stress of the injury. It's how the other, how the body reacts and everything is a physiological response. So I always give this, I, this is a horrible analogy, but it is very true. I always use this, and I teach this to a lot of my students in my exercise science class, when I talk about the way the blood flows better and the oxygen flows through the muscles, you know, um, when, when you're injured and how not to be so stressed out and we work on relaxation techniques. I always say that uh, more often than not in a, a drunk driving accident, who is the person who, who is more likely to get killed? Most of the time, it's the person who sees it coming, not the drunk guy or the drunk gal. You know what I mean? And because they tense up. Anybody, you know, you, you, you tense up. The other guy's loose because he's, you know, hammered or, you know, drank too much, you know, and the other person. So it's, it's very similar to someone who is injured. If you're stressed about this injury or you're stressed about something else in your life, you are not going to heal the same way because the oxygen is not going to flow. The blood's not going to flow. And I think people also need to know that psychological component because they look at you guys as doctors. Well, you're come on. You got to fix me. You know, you have to fit. Well, I can only do so much. So instead of, like I said, presenting them with the problem of their injury. Well, here are some solutions. You have to make sure. One, you understand this injury and what it entails physically that you, what you need to do to get better. And two, psychologically, I can't be there for you. You have to work on yourself. And this is what you need to do. This is what you can do. And that's very important when, again, when it comes to the mind body component, because it could be a, a small injury and people could exasperate it because of what's going on up here. Yeah. I've got some little notes that I'm going to get to them about some of the things you've just said. So things that we can, questions we can ask and also strategies. And I'm going to come back onto that. But before I do, okay. just what I reminded myself I wanted to talk about a, a concept that I know you know very well personally um, from reading your book and reading your own story about it. And I know that, that injured athletes have it all the time. And that's this, this loss of identity that comes with uh, being an athlete who identifies as, as an athlete and now you're injured, you can no longer do what you do. So you, you lose, because that's what you identify as, you, you feel like you lose that identity. And I don't just mean a professional basketball player that's now injured and can't play basketball. I mean, you know, I see people in, in, in London who are lawyers and accountants and they are, they're training for marathons. And when, that, when I sort of talk to them and, and chat to them when they first come in, they, they introduce themselves to me as I'm a runner that they don't ever say to me i'm a lawyer who runs or i'm an accountant who runs they are a runner that's their identity so now they're injured they 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 find they, they find that they uh, have lost that identity so i wanted to talk to you a bit about the pain associated with that and 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 i guess the strategies that we can take to try and, and help because what i've certainly found myself doing rightly or wrongly 
and I'm happy to be told uh, if, if there's a better way to do it, is I try and allow them to still identify, you know, even though you can't run, you can still identify as a runner when you're not running. You could see this injury as an opportunity to, you know, tidy up some of the other things that elite runners do that perhaps when we look at the way you do, you sit at a desk for 12 hours a day, whereas elite runners do a lot of supplementary strength work and they sleep well and they eat well um, and they read lots and they meditate actually now that you're not running all the time that you normally spend running maybe you could spend that time doing some of the things that elite runners do as well as running and then when you're you're ready to run again you're actually this this injury is an opportunity to come back a better stronger more resilient runner and i don't know if that's a good way to do it um but i found it kind of keeps them engaged and keeps them somehow linked with that identity and again as a runner you can then volunteer at races a bit more difficult in team sports i know reading in your book you know tough to sit on the bench as an injured player and watch your teammates on the court i know so could you just give us a bit of your if, if, if you're comfortable doing so your personal experience about the pain of loss of identity and perhaps ways uh, that better ways that we can help as the as the medical provider or the healthcare provider well, first, I, I want to speak to the latter part of what you said, the beginning part of what you said. Um, I absolutely love that. I think it's very, right there, you were presenting a solution to the problem for for people. I'm moving away from my camera here. Let me fix this. Um, I, I feel like you're, wait, this way. There we go. Um, you're presenting uh, solutions. And I, I love everything that you said about that because you're giving them up ideas of, Okay, this is what you can do now to make you stronger in the meantime while well, you can't run. So you're getting better, faster, stronger, right? And then your mind will get stronger too, and the confidence will come, and it will also help. Um, you would hope to decrease a little bit of that pain that they're feeling. For me, um, you know, identity is it's so tricky because for myself, as a young girl, I just identified myself as a, a basketball player. I still do. I'm a player. I play basketball. I still play. I was told I couldn't, I would never do it. I'm just turned 50 years old and I play in, you know, men's leagues in Philadelphia, you know, and they beat me up, but I love it. And I, and I just, you know, and you know, it's funny, everything else hurts, but my back, which is very ironic, you know, but I, because I worked very hard to keep my back strong. Like I always joke around when I'm in the, the gym and I say, I maintain my body now. Like I won't train it the way I did back when, because I would never get out of bed. You know, some people can do it. I can't. I've had too many surgeries. I've had too many things go on with myself. But um, when I lost my, my, my career and I was told I was done, I was deeply affected by it. Um, I was seriously depressed. I, I wrote in my book, I contemplated suicide. I lost myself. Who, who am I if I'm not playing ball? Like, who, who is Laura Mealy? Like, who is this person? Um, and what am I going to do now? All I wanted to do was play basketball. I wanted to be, I wanted to be, you know, one of the first women on Home Globetrotters. I, back when I was young in high school, I, I want, you know, I was supposed to go 1992 Olympics. What, what am I supposed to do? I wanted to be an Olympian. Like, now what? And, you know, that's a really hard pill to swallow for some people. And me especially, it hit me hard. And when I speak to some of my other teammates, they don't feel that. And I noticed the difference between them and myself is they got to finish out their season. You know, they got to finish out their collegiate career. Some of them even went overseas. Um, some of them became unbelievable coaches. You know, I found my identity again now through coaching and, and also still on the side and, and working with young children. I love to train and, and work with young children. I work with gymnasts. I used to work with ice skaters. I started, you know, teaching gymnastics and then and, and I still coach basketball, volleyball, softball. You know, I run speed agility clinics. I do whatever I can basically to fill that void that I, I had from the loss of my basketball so many years ago. Um, I'd be lying. And I just said it to my daughter the other day. I said, you know, mommy still hurts when I see some of these athletes, um, these women basketball players, get, you know, there's so much more coverage today than there was years ago, you know, and then, you know, you always wonder, I, I know I would have been there. There's not a doubt in my mind. And it, and it hurts sometimes. And I'm like, oh, I'm 50. You think you'd get over that a little bit, you know, what's, what's wrong. And then, but I, I don't say what's wrong with me anymore. I go, you know, it's because I loved it so much, but I never gave up anything else. I always said I would fill the void. 
whatever basketball that void had left, I continued on and I pushed through. But for other people who go through it, um, I can I, I can empathize, you know, with them and sympathize with them because it's it's not an easy thing when you you know I grew up in New York City. We didn't grow up with a lot of money, and to me, I wanted to get a basketball scholarship and I wanted to be the best. And and you know maybe I put too much into that because the, there wasn't so much around me, you know. Um, so I'm kind of careful for the fine line now with the children that I work with and with my own children. You know, um, the way I used to coach when I was in my 20s, I was very intense versus the way I coach now is so different because I think about children's identities. I think about if I focus so much on that ball you just missed or that shot you just missed or that pass you just threw away, what am I teaching them? I'm teaching them this, that, you know, when tomorrow no one's even going to remember. You know what I mean? Unless it was like a game winning situation where everybody remembers, but you know, for the most part. So I try to minimize that identity with some of my athletes because I worry that they may go through something I go through if they play division one or whatever division, you know, sport they play or they go to the pros. When it's over, I want them to feel fulfilled. So I teach the, the children, my children, uh, the, you know, the teens, the college uh, athletes I'm around, I'm like, you know what, focus on the big picture of what you really want for your life besides sports. And then you can revolve it around sports. What I do for a living still entails sports. It still entails fitness and still entails recreation. I get to do what I love every single day. And it was because of sports. And maybe I wouldn't be doing this if I wasn't injured because I felt like I had to fill that void. But um, identity is real and people stay claiming their identity. And even somebody who is a weekend warrior, attorney, lawyer, whoever, uh, I mean, an attorney or whoever, accountant, whoever you mentioned, you know, even though they're runners, that's their outlet. You know, they have stress. Maybe the job is stressful. Their life is stressful. And for people like for me, that was my outlet to get away from some of the stuff going on growing up as a child. And it was the, it was my, it got me away from everything. So when it was stripped away, well, what now? This was the only thing that made me tick. This was the only thing that, you know, helped me get through everything. So I believe that's why that accountant, that lawyer says, I am a runner, because in their mind, as much as what that's what they do, but who they are is, is, is that athlete, because that is what makes them tick and helps them get through the day. And when people lose that, um, you know, it, it's comparable to a surgeon, for instance, God forbid a surgeon, you know, ruins his hands. I mean, that's detrimental not only to his livelihood, but that's going to crush his psyche. Who am I? You know, especially like a plastic surgeon, for instance. You know, I, I know plastic surgeons were like, I don't even, I used to be a basketball player in college. I won't even attempt it. I will do nothing that's going to jam my fingers or anything because I have to make precise movements when I'm performing surgery and I can't do it. So that's, I mean, identity can go across the board for different ways for people. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, Craig, did you want to? You, I think you. There's a story that's uh, pretty much on this topic in Australia that's fairly um, recent. Yeah, me, isn't there? Let me just share my screen. Yeah, this was a that, that those from Australia will be quite familiar with this story. And this is a. I should send Laura this link. This is a um, Stephanie Rice who who was won a couple of gold medals in the swimming at the 2008 Beijing Olympics and. Obviously, during the Tokyo Olympics, she posted a a video on Instagram about the impact that the Tokyo Olympics had on her, how relevant or irrelevant she thinks she's become. And even just looking at that image there, you can see her, her face on Instagram. So I just wonder if you just comment on that. This not specifically her, but the, the, the these elite athletes who really struggle when their careers are over, either through injury or through retirement. Um, and I, I think at least uh, every month or so here, we, we get a story in the news media about one of them struggling and having issues. Well, you know, you're, you're seeing it. What makes me happy, and I don't mean this against this right here, is that they're talking about it. 
finally, we're talking about the mental health of athletes. There's so much pressure placed on Olympic athletes. And I mentioned it toward the end of my book. It's called The Weight of Gold. I finally uh, had an opportunity. While I was writing my book, I just saw the trailer of it. But I, I didn't want to watch it because I didn't want it to influence my book. But I don't know if you've had the opportunity to watch The Weight of Gold. If you do, it is tremendous. Michael Phelps narrates it. He, you know, was really struggling with the end of the not only his Olympic career, but when the Olympic ended, like soon as it's over, all the games, you know, they, 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 all this training and it's so intense and there's so much pressure and then boom, you're home, everybody celebrates and boom, now you've forgotten. And that's like, you know, you're at this real big high and then you drop down to a real low and not just, you know, this athlete, but many athletes go through that and some can't handle it and some take their own lives, which is very, very sad, which I also mentioned in my book. And I believe I named, I think it's the Speedy Foundation. Um, it, it, they, they talk about him in the Weight of Gold um, uh, documentary. He was, uh, I believe, an Olympic skier. Uh, and, and he he just, he really struggled with mental health issues on and off you know, being an athlete outside, he had a bit many personal struggles. Um, I think a lot of athletes, you have to remember, they're not just athletes, right? They're people. So they have extenuating circumstances in their life that none of us really know about. Um, so besides the pressure of being this elite athlete and getting yourself to that place, you don't know what else is going on that is influencing their, their, their psyche. So when it's over, and maybe this was that big escape, like I talk about an outlet, when it's over and now real life have to smack you in the face and your sports might have been your escape for all that time, I personally believe that that's what happens. These athletes, they were able to escape for a long period of time and, and go and go and go. And then they retire. One, they're nobody even knows them anymore, right? And two, they have to go back to whatever that they left in their home life and where they live, whatever they have been contending with. And they actually have to deal with it now. Sometimes it's easier to handle those pressures of being an athlete, you know, and dealing with the competition because it drives you. So where's the driving force when they step out of it? How do they, if, if they've always escaped as an athlete and were able to handle any of those pressures, I mean, for myself, I was a pressure cooker. I love to be on the line. You know, we were down by one shooting two, you know, with no time left on a clock. That's me. Um, and a lot of elite athletes were the same. So when they step out of that, it's sometimes they feel like their world falls apart and they don't know where their place is. And I, and I believe even in my book and, and not that I'm trying to plug my book, but I write about it. But I, I mean, it's true. I'm writing, I write about it in my book, the displaced athlete, you know, you, you're done in that athletic world. Now what, you know, where do I belong? Okay. Now I have a job, you know, I'm getting on the elevator. I'm going to my office and I'm around people who have no idea the trenches I've been in as an athlete or, or the competition. And it's very hard sometimes to find your place in society. And I'm really proud of those athletes, especially the Olympic athletes right now who are stepping up and discussing, hey, you know what? We have some mental health issues too. It's just not the, the average person. It's us too, because we are average people and we are normal people when we step out of our sport. You know, they, they, they're so glamorized and idolized that people forget that their psyche and the their physiology of the brain works like everybody else's. And as much as we want to put them on a, a pedestal, we have to remember they need assistance too. And I believe who got backlash? One of the tennis players, um, I think. Osama. Osama. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. She, I mean, yeah. she got a lot of backlash. And then even um, in the Olympics, the, the the gymnast, of course, I can't remember names right now. Simone Biles. Yeah. 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 You know, and, and I was really upset about that because mm. these are the people are being critical who don't have a, a, you know, a PhD behind their name in psychology, you know, and or have even some people have it not even uh, have the privy of being part of an elite sport. So I'm really proud of these athletes that have stepped up and say this, even this athlete here, you know, it, it's real. And hopefully they'll find people who can identify with the fact that 
the pressure is over. This was a little bit of an escape for you. Now you have to deal with real life and deal with the stuff that you might have never dealt with that was always there. But it becomes very real mm. when, when you know, the lights go down, you know? Yeah, it's, interesting, it's interesting if you delve into the politics of it. Do, do the sports or the sporting bodies have a duty of care to their former athletes? And that's, you know, it's like, and I know some of the, especially the main professional sporting code here in Melbourne, they have for a long time been well aware of this issue and they do have um, officers or employees whose job is literally to um, look at after sporting careers, careers, you know, putting things in place for these athletes. You know, they've earned the big money. Some of them seem to throw it away. Others succeed. And that, that I know there are strategies being put in place to try and deal with that. So I think, well, this code here, obviously believe they do have a duty of care to their former players. Um, so it's quite a political issue in, in, in following down that. I believe if, if they, they do have a duty of care, but I also believe if they started it from the onset, then the duty would be less. So for instance, yeah. um, you know, division one athletes who come in from high school, it's a complete different world. You know, the, the pressure of academics, the pressure of school, at least here in the States, right? It, it, there's a lot of pressure. Then if they go to the pros, now they, boom, they have all this money. You know, they somehow, there has to be a duty by the, the, the colleges, universities, or even the professional, um, any professional teams to ensure that psychologically they can handle it. I know that there are a lot of athletes, and I can't mention names, that I've, I've been reached out in the pro, you know, you know um, out here in Philly and, and, and when I was in New York, that when they first came in, they were they were having, like, seriously, like, some psychological meltdowns because they got so much pressure from not only the sports, the money, the families of their friends and their family getting on them, you know, just picking at them because, hey, I want you to buy me a house or I want this. And then they still have to go and perform and they have that pressure. So they also have to be taught how to handle that. And, you know, people say, well, there's no book on, on how to like, for instance, raise a child, but guess what? There are books out there about transitioning out of, you know, into different parts of sport. And if they're not, there are sports psych, you know, psychology consultants or sports psychologists who can assist them with that. And I think the duty of care of the Olympic committee uh, um, and of the professional sports would, would be minimized if at certain levels, athletes have this situation addressed. Yeah, that makes sense. So, looping back to our one of our central tenets of of, our, of this podcast, which is always we're trying, as we say, we're trying to be a bit less shit, i.e., be 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 better. Um, we we acknowledge now that you know every injured athlete that sits in front of us in clinic, regardless of of their sport, regardless of their injury, and and regardless of the level they compete at, every injured athlete there's going to be physical components and mental components to that experience that that scenario we we in the medical profession are, are definitely guilty probably because of the way we've been trained that really you know we're taught how to take a history we're taught how to communicate with these people but when you look at what we're asking and the conversations we, we're taught to have it's it's heavily leaning towards the physical tell me where it hurts tell me the mechanism of injury tell me whether you're getting any night pain, describe the pain, you know, et cetera, et cetera. What can you do? What's pro what, what, what provokes it? What, what eases it, et cetera. And it becomes clear that we're, we probably don't ask enough about the mental side of things. Um, now, I, I don't mean, I know there are lots of validated, you know, questionnaires and tools out there that can look at, you know, uh, kinesophobia and all those kind of things. But just on a conversational level, when we've got an injured athlete in front of us, and again, leaning back on your book, which um, I know we keep doing, but it is a great read. You, you refer to sort of warning signs when, you know, um, when people, you know, towards the end of the book, your sort of list of your, your warning signs of when people may be getting in a bad way. What sort of questions on that conversational level, akin to the physical questions we ask, could we or should we be asking when we first meet an athlete that both help us draw information from them but at the same time don't don't make the athlete feel like they're being uh, you know, like we're, we're analyzed. Being, yeah yeah absolutely because athletes they expect the physical questions don't they and maybe the reason we don't ask the mental is is partly because we weren't taught to but partly because we know 
we might get that quizzical look from the athlete about why you're trying to get in my head when it's my calf that I've torn, for example. So are there are a few kind of um, a few questions that you think we could or should be sort of asking almost every athlete in the same way we would ask every athlete about their mechanism of injury. Are there equivalent mental questions that we could we could approach them with? Well, um, in the book, I had I had wrote that I had put together a questionnaire that I was using at the at Connecticut Children's Medical Center with the um, with the physical therapists because I, I they had come up to me and they had said, you know, I have some athletes who are um, not really adhering well to the rehab. What you know, what do you think? They I don't think they're okay. So I put together the questionnaire so I could figure out. Um, if they were going to be on their onset of situational depression, because as soon as that happens, it is going to um, minimize their, their, it's going to basically elongate their recovery. Okay. So when you're talking to athletes, you, I don't know if necessarily there's buzz questions to ask them as to let them know that their mental um, state is just as important as their physical. And if anything's going on with them, that's affecting that that will exasperate the pain that will take longer for, you know, it will impede their recovery. Um, but you can ask them, you know, Hey, how you, you know, I think just a, just a common conversation. How are you feeling? You know, sometimes I know some of my athletes are kind of down. Are you good with this? Like, what can, what can I do and see what they say to you? And then you just point them in a the direction and say, you know what, there are a lot of books or there's a lot of areas you can look at, but I think the biggest thing, um, is for people to uh, just to ask them how they're feeling, really. And they'll, they usually tell you, like, this sucks, I'm in pain. And then you can say, you know what, um, sometimes the, I'm not minimizing your pain, but it, it, sometimes it could be better if you visualize or you try to see yourself healthy again. Or it just depends because I don't think there's any cookie cutter questions because every patient you have that comes in who, who's an athlete is going to be different. So if you have a cookie cutter set of questions, I don't think it's necessarily going to help the athlete or you. I think that you just have to see and, and feel how they're feeling. Um, I would suggest looking at the, that list that I gave that I, that I have I provided in the book. Um, if you want to use it once we're off camera, I can tell you how to score it because I didn't write the scoring on there, but I can tell you guys how to score it. Um, it's very much like the state trait um, anxiety score scale. I based it on that. And then you can see if people are, are going to um, adhere more or, or, or they're going to end up getting really down. They're going to go down. I'm not saying to a full-blown depression, but they could be into a situational depression. And as we discussed earlier, when people start to get depressed or they get anxiety over their injury, um, then they're going to um, prolong this injury a little bit more. And, and I think that's something important for them to know. Perhaps... Um, find something and I can always find it and send it to you guys where you just post you know people sitting around waiting for you to come into the office just a little read you know on the wall or a little pamphlet about you know um how important the psychology is to the injury you, you know that kind of thing um there is psychological adherence um questionnaires maybe pull a few questions from that Britton Brewer uh Dr. Britton Brewer who is one of my mentors and one of my favorite people who assisted me greatly with my uh doctorate he has um some um I believe questionnaires on that maybe pull from some questions from that um but I think by having maybe which I don't see ever and I've and I get injured a lot still because I could play and I'm always running I ran into some steel beam and messed up my hip like two years ago, you know, and, and I'm just sitting around and I always try to read the literature that's in there and there's nothing about psychology, but ironically, what I, what I really loved about the, the former orthopedic surgeon, his name was Dr. Carl Nissen. He's in Connecticut. He's an excellent orthopedic surgeon. He was my boss. He, he loved the sports psychology, the whole dynamic behind it. And he ended up having uh, his spine fused. And we did a segment on the NBC News out in Connecticut um, discussing, it was on him talking about how he felt exactly how what we're talking about. He felt lost because he's a runner. 
and he couldn't run. He just had his back fused and he started getting really depressed and irritable. So he would tell me, and that's when we went on the segment and I would talk about him and how, you know, how it all comes together. But he started having little pamphlets. He had me write out a little pamphlet. So when people came in, they could read about injury and psychology. And he loved that. He was very into it. And he it was very comprehensive where the way we worked with people, because I was able to sometimes he'd call me in and sometimes talk to the patients about, you know, trying to find literature to help them because it's not just about the physical. And they have to understand that when the mind gets divorced from the body, then where's the healing? You know, there has to be that connection in order to heal. So I would suggest perhaps putting little pamphlets around you know, um, your, your offices, people can even get a good read and, or you can hand it to them. So yeah. you're not insulting them. Oh, I give this to everybody who's injured. You might, you know, and the people who really feel like they might be hurting a little bit will say, Oh, I want to read this. Maybe I want to know more. Yeah. I think it's been too easy for too long when we, you know, when we refer to ourselves as the foot specialists, as we often do in podiatry, that the foot's just so far away from the brain that, you know, I say it jokingly, but, you know, we, we, we are guilty of forgetting there's a human attack. This foot's on the end of a human and we're yeah. treating the human. We're not, we're not treating the foot. Uh, Craig, I'm conscious of the time. Any, anything we need to bring in from the Facebook comments? No, I, I actually think we've got, there's a technical error going on facebook with commenting i've tried to post a couple of comments and they won't post so i'm not sure there's so so apologies to anyone who oh. might have tried to post a comment that we're not getting them um with, but it, look, one thing, there is, that's a disaster isn't it as well yeah yeah <laughs> um, actually but one, one thing that just listening to you talking laura several things have struck me about what we've done previous previous episodes on um we've done previous episodes on um to do with pain pain science and things like you know words matter have come up in a number of episodes a couple of episodes ago we, we looked at sleep and the importance of that that all fits in with this um, we've done an episode on motivational interviewing and that it all sort of fits in with what you're saying um, but I also can't help but think about the episodes we've done on the diabetic foot and, di and people with diabetes and foot ulcers it's the exact same issues about the loss of identity and the impact that has on them so I, I just kept thinking about how many episodes we've done on so many similar themes um as diverse as the injured athlete and the, the diabetic foot ulcer you know it, it's it's the same words matter well, I like that. It's, just trans it's translational i mean yeah. it just goes across it just goes across the board i think it's not you know when i when i tell people about my book and some of my friends who aren't like athletes and they're going through stuff i go you know you really should read this chapter or this about my book because the book isn't necessarily about um the athlete for, it's about it being injured psychologically injured yeah. you know mentally where you, you you come to a crossroad or you hit a wall and and I think people who aren't even athletes go through it, you know, um, they, everyone, you know, sometimes people are like, well, I don't want to do this career anymore. I want this. And then, you know, you, you, you have that disconnect. And it's really about a, a disconnect. But, you know, for you guys, I wouldn't say put so much pressure on yourselves that you're not exactly addressing all the mental one. I've been fighting for years and, and trying to say that psychology of injury should be for every doctor, you know, as a prerequisite, everything. So you can have an idea what your patient is thinking and feeling. OK, especially the athletes or whoever call themselves athletes. Right. But, you know, all I say is just do words do matter. So for the most part, and, you know, if you have some kind of literature in there, then you're, you know, you're not passing the buck, but it's not your job to be their psychologist, but it is for you to be somewhat empathetic to what they're going through and, and not just, you're right, there is a human attached to that foot and, that, and that's perfect. And that is perfect. And I think by you letting your patients know that you care, that they're, they're more to their, their injury than just the injury, that in itself is going to help them too. So kudos to both of you for for knowing, you know, to to like <laughs> conscience of it. Because there's not a lot I'm telling you. I've heard a lot of doctors say a lot of things, and I'm just like, oh, you know, <laughs> you're, you're really hurting this person <laughs> more than the injury. <laughs>
Yeah, Word, words matter. Okay, so look, thanks so much, Laura. The, hour, the hour's gone really quickly. Um, apologies for any technical issues that have come up, but I, I will edit this video and I will have it up on YouTube later today, um, Australia time. So thanks so much, Laura, and uh, thanks, Ian. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for having me, and please send me the link. I appreciate it.